Beyond the tight security and high walls, street gangs are roaming out of control. But things aren't all they seem. The razor wire and electric fences that keep the intruders at bay surround a luxury golfing estate in South Africa. A 500-acre man-made Eden called Mount Edgecombe. And the gangs are vervet monkeys, primates with attitude. Like us, in so many ways, vervets get a mixed press. Love them or hate them, you've got to admit, they're good at staying alive. Vervets are masters of walking the line when so much of Africa's wildlife has been driven to the margins. But this very success has brought them into deeper and deeper conflict with their cousins, the super primates, us. cities grow, the monkey habitat shrinks. Conflict with humans becomes inevitable. As does competition between monkey troops. The problem is space, or lack of it. Mount Edgecombe's resident monkeys, the Pali troop, have been forced off their home turf by arch rivals, the sugarcane gang. But the ragtag out-of-town sugars aren't used to life in the genteel surroundings of Mount Edgecombe. They've never lived this close to humans and are set on a collision course with their increasingly hostile new neighbours. Matters are getting out of hand. Meanwhile, the exiled Parnies are roaming and finding out the hard way what it's like to have no home and no friends in a harsh world. Pony Troop's world and all the fundamentals of life that came with it have been turned upside down ever since they were driven from their home by the rival Sugarcane Gang. No more free handouts from vervet sugar mama Lynette Weber at her Twin Palms home and monkey sanctuary. No more membership of the exclusive golf club with alfresco breakfasts and lunches. No more security in the Pani bush with its safe night roosting and fruiting trees. Overwhelmed by the sugarcane gang's hostile takeover, the Pani's have to make the momentous decision to find somewhere new to live. This is Brains, the alpha male of the Pani troop. Brains is the first to scout the neighbouring estate using the aerial highway that takes him safely across busy roads and electric fences. There could be trouble ahead. Alpha female Bess follows close behind. The very future of the Pony Troop is now at stake. But male and female vervets have very different agendas. Will they be able to cooperate through this crisis and rise to the challenge of creating a new settlement? Although this neighbouring estate looks friendly enough, the Pines have no idea what to expect on the other side of the fence. Their arrival won't go unnoticed. At this estate, 
the Green Briars are the resident troop. They view the Pawnees with deep suspicion. But the Pawnees had no choice and Brains and Bess return to collect the rest of the troop. Their exodus from Mount Edgecombe, the home they've known for so long, has begun. The infants and juveniles seem blissfully unaware of the magnitude of what is happening. This could just be another outing. Mr. Cool brings up the rear. Mr. Cool is Brain's second in command, an ambitious and upwardly mobile monkey with his sights set at the top. The current housing crisis has served Mr. Cool well. He's capitalized on the atmosphere of uncertainty. His star is on the ascent and he seems reluctant to follow. Rootless, Brains and Bess are taking the troop into new, unknown territory and into a very uncertain future. Back when they lived on the Mount Edgecombe estate, the Pawnees knew the ropes, knew their boundaries, who was friendly and who wasn't. Here in Terra Incognita, they have no boundaries. No signposts, no experience to rely on. They're on a steeper learning curve as the sugarcane gang are, lording it up back at their old home. There's been a total reversal of roles for the two vervet troops. Sugars in, Parnies out. Can the exiles adapt to a life of wandering? Can the sugars deal with the abundance of Mount Edgecombe, but without upsetting their human neighbours? Pawnees are now the trespassers, and immigrant life is tough. Once, they dined on banquets of stolen goodies. Today, they're reduced to sharing a single grapefruit, which literally passes from hand to mouth throughout the whole troop. As alpha female, Bess gets first turn, while her son Joseph looks on impatiently. Joseph's insistence pays off, and as the golden boy of the juveniles, he gets second turn on the grapefruit. A much handled and now grubby grapefruit has worked its way down the Pawnee hierarchy when Brain shows up. Things really have hit rock bottom when Brains is reduced to confiscating a mauled grapefruit and Bess has to settle for sugarcane. Joseph is keen for a second turn, but he ought to know better than to bother the alpha male. Brains isn't feeling charitable today. A quick flash of his canines and Joseph is sent on his way. Here, in the territory of the Green Briar Gang, the Pawnees don't know where the flowering and fruiting trees are, nor do they understand the local politics, vervet or human. Confrontation is inevitable. All of this couldn't have come at a worse moment for the Pawnee troop. Mufazi, a high-ranking member of Bess's sisterhood, is heavily pregnant and scrounging. And so too are other members of the troop.
Bess and Mafazi have had their differences in the past. But in this current crisis, the sisterhood must go into survival mode. They need to stand shoulder to shoulder if they're to weather this latest twist of fate. For the pregnant females, access to a high quality food source is essential if they're going to develop healthy offspring. And for the remaining females not yet pregnant, they simply will not conceive if they're so stressed. As a high ranking female, Mufazi has the pick of what's available. But less fortunate females further down the hierarchical ladder are facing real hardship. This is Sawpaw, who's also pregnant, and she's in terrible condition already. The chances of Sawpaw's pregnancy going to full term are looking less and less likely as the food situation deteriorates. But where stress unites females and reduces internal conflict, outside pressures instead tend to split the male hierarchy making dominant males even more assertive and less confident males even more timid. Now out of their familiar environment, the male hierarchy is increasingly unstable. Brains is facing insurrection. Loss of confidence and high stress levels are creating instability at the top. With so many wannabes, Brains is chasing his tail as he desperately seeks to re-establish his dominance. Only recently, Brains had little difficulty in imposing his authority over other males as he did when he effortlessly relieved injured outsider Tyson of this fine prize. Tyson was left fighting for his life the last time he challenged the Pani hierarchy. But things are now different. Today, he has an apple, and he has no intention of giving it up. Pony girl Lena is allowed to watch and even pick up some scraps, but that's it. When Brains arrives, Tyson shows due deference with ritual lip smacking. But it's exactly that, lip service. Brains makes his position and his request even clearer. But Tyson's grip tightens on his prize. Eventually, Brains, faced with an insubordinate subordinate with a three-quarter eaten apple, moves off. It's not worth it. Tyson's still recovering with massive injuries and is hardly a threat. There are other, far more able monkeys on the make. Brains' world is changing all around him. Robbie, the ambitious newcomer, is just such a pretender to Brain's throne. His recent stand against a rival troop marked a critical turning point in his career. And ever since, alpha female Bess has been showing him a great deal of attention. Robbie is surprisingly ambivalent about the direct advances Bess is making in his direction. 
Look what happened to Tyson, another Pani troop wannabe who stepped over the mark and paid in blood. But is it a gamble worth taking? Alpha female, Bess is a fine catch, and Robbie will be a fool not to take what's on offer. If he can get away with it whilst more dominant males aren't looking. Bess's son, Joseph, is not going to stand back and allow Robbie to receive all the attention, and with the support of another juvenile male, seems determined to get in the way. But in a flash, all goes wrong. Bess turns on her lover. A replay can reveal what happened. Robbie's big mistake was to snap at Bess's admittedly extremely annoying son, Joseph, demanding attention and intent on spoiling the moment. For Bess, her existing maternal duties far outweigh a quick fling with Robbie. Bess switches from flirt to fight in the blink of an eye. Robbie retreats to a nearby tree. Another chance missed. Will he ever get lucky? Robbie seems to lack the X factor, the essential ingredient that singles out certain males for the top job. Across the barbed wire, the sugar canes are having their way with the delights of Mount Edgecombe. I don't enjoy them, um, and, I, and I do find them a nuisance. And they know where you keep your bananas. I'm a monkey fan, I adore them. <laughs> it's almost impossible to feel indifferent about vervets. I'd like to see them, half of them, go so that we haven't got so many. I'm quite happy to have them around. I just love, love Africa and I love everything about it. I've had them in the lounge, I've had them in the bedroom, I've had them in the kitchen, but uh, they're great. <laughs> At Mount Edgecombe, under Brains and Bess, the Pawnee troops seem to have established an understanding of how far they could push the residents, what was and what was not permissible. The sugarcane gang, by contrast, have arrived with very different attitudes and few boundaries. That hose, and, and I hose him down. You see, look at him. Look at him. Not a bit afraid. Oh, you break the window. Those are my pebbles. <laughs> One of the Vervet's greatest supporters has noticed a distinct change in behaviour in the new order. Lynette Weber runs Mount Edgecombe's unofficial monkey sanctuary and feeding station, and from daily encounters, she knows the troops extremely well. The sugarcane gangs definitely got um, more street fighting abilities than the Pawnee Bush troop. Um, they most probably have to, to fight their way a bit more they're definitely not as um, well behaved, I would say, as a Barney Bush troop. So, you know, they did maybe have a few dirty tactics and then got their way in here. Um, but that's being a monkey. Fruit bowl, they'll come and take your fruit. They know how to open the bread bins, take the bread out. They scatter everything all over and make a mess on the floor, and then they disappear. They've often come into our house and need to be chased away and finding them in my kitchen and eating my cakes and breads is a huge irritation. This is Gizmo, a high-ranking member of the sugarcane gang. 
He's enjoying the opportunities of his new life on Mount Edgecombe. Gizmo is an exceptionally intelligent vervet and is picking things up quickly. Even a complicated locking device won't fool him for long. Many of Mount Edgecombe's residents return to find uninvited visitors. Vervets are very aware of the possibilities of being trapped. Outside, Gizmo can give this challenge his full attention. Without the years of experience that the Parnies had built up on Mount Edgecombe, the Sugarcane Gang are running riot. They've brought their rough downtown manners with them. I mean, they're sweet and all that, but they, now they're becoming a nuisance and aggressive at times. Extremely aggressive, yeah. I think it's becoming a, a serious problem that you can't actually relax anymore without worrying about the, what the monkeys are doing and whether they're coming or not. The maternal instinct runs strong in all primates, and when juveniles are threatened, the strongest protective reactions are immediately provoked. Mothers who've got small children and their, their monkeys go in and take the food out of their mouths and you worry that they're going to hurt them, you know. Some of them are quite big, so they're quite daunting. I mean, they look at you and they look quite ferocious. Threats to property are one thing, but when monkeys start to threaten humans, and especially youngsters, it's quite another. Some individuals are now taking the law into their own hands, with fatal consequences. On a porch of a Mount Edgecombe house, a member of the sugarcane gang writhes in agony. The resident, unable to do much else, calls Steve Smith and Carol Booth, yes. animal welfare campaigners who run the only monkey rescue operation in the area. They respond immediately, but the situation doesn't look good for this monkey. Members of the gang nervously visit their stricken comrade, mm. a fully grown male in prime condition. There's very little evidence of loyalty between male vervets, but these monkeys stay with their dying brother till the very last minute. But by the time Steve and Carol arrive, it's too late. Yeah, he's young, he's a beautiful male, look at that. Yeah, that's a tough Often we'll find a monkey like this, not necessarily this one, that appears to have died from another injury or is badly injured because it's caught by a dog or hit by a car or fallen out of a tree. And you wonder, you know, how that happened. How did the dog manage to catch such an agile animal or why did the car hit it? At this stage, the cause of death is uncertain. There's no blood or external evidence of injury. 
The body is carried off for a post-mortem. Fights between vervets seem ferocious. The wounds they inflict can be severe, but for the most part, actual physical contact is rare and largely avoided. It's all bluff and bluster, charges full of sound and fury, but with very little significant injury. Okay, this is the x-ray from the monkey that we um, got from my edge in the state this morning. Um, as you can see, he's been shot multiple times with a pellet gun. The vast number of fatalities now are due to humans. Accidentally, or in the case of this unfortunate sugarcane gang member, most definitely deliberate. Uh, these are just a few pellets that are still in them. There must be some that actually gone right through and out the other side. Yeah, the kidneys are okay. Vervets, it would seem, are far more successful than their super primate cousins in sorting out disagreement without resorting to violence. Primatologist Hallam Payne has been studying South Africa's primates for the past decade. Well, monkeys are really good at assessing risk. They know what the consequences are of getting into escalated aggression. And so they either seek cooperation and build social bonds between each other, or they try and show and impress each other about who's the strongest. There's a lot of signals that monkeys use to avoid conflict. Uh, the most obvious one is uh, with the males. They have very obviously brightly coloured blue and red genitals. And the male monkeys look at each other, try and size each other up by the intensity of the colour. And depending on how well they match up, they will decide to either escalate aggression or back down. With the female vervets, it's about who you know and who you're related to. The more higher-ranking relatives you have, the more likely you are to be backed up in a fight. Other females will know this, and they'll back down. As humans, we also have those subtle signals of status, and we're very good at reading them in each other. But when it comes to reading other species, we're not as good. Whether it's submissive displays like lip-smacking or dominance displays like broadsiding, grooming to win favour, yawning to show teeth, or the conspicuous shows of colourful genitalia, Vervets have evolved a whole range of gestures and rituals to put off actual conflict for as long as possible. Vervets may be tolerant, but there is a limit. The exile Pawnees, deep in another troop's territory, have long outstayed their welcome. Out here, on the Greenbrier estate, they're on borrowed time and borrowed ground. The resident Greenbriars are not prepared to put up with these bin raiders any longer. And finally, after two days of watching from the bushes, they come out in force. The long-awaited and inevitable confrontation is finally about to unfold. 
On their home turf, the odds are stacked in the favour of the Greenbrier gang. But just as the Parnies seem to be facing certain defeat, an unexpected turn of events reverses the fortunes of war. Like a character out of a vervet's worst nightmare, Tyson, the battle-scarred bogeyman, is the accidental hero of the day. Shaven, sewn and patched, Franken Tyson cuts a strange and menacing figure and sends the Greenbriars off in confusion. While other parties cower, Tyson struts confidently. Remarkably, but typically, the conflict ends without any injury to either side. But, in all the confusion, one of the Pawnee juveniles, Little Sagan, has been killed. Not by another monkey, but by a motor car. With her damaged ear, little Sagan probably didn't hear what was coming and was killed instantly. Little Sagan's death appears to be the final straw for the Pani sisterhood. Many of the females are pregnant and the stress of a new area with all the uncertainties and shortages of food and shelter is proving too much. For Brains, the growing threat from rival males and the internal pressures on his leadership also seem to be urging him back to an area that he's at least familiar with. And so now, after a week in the unknown and with one fewer member, the troop make the dangerous return crossing back to Mount Edgecombe. It's time to face the sugarcane gang again. This is the Pawnee's ancestral home, and at its heart, the Pawnee bush, with its security and fruiting trees, a last piece of monkey paradise. This is a prize worth fighting to reclaim. The rival sugarcane gang have been roaming the Edgecombe estate for almost a week now and growing in confidence every day. But there's one place which the sugars have probably not discovered yet. The Pawnee's head for Plantation House, in the heart of the Edgecombe estate. They know it well, a secret spot where they can regroup. This has always been a special place for the Pawnee troop, a place where youngsters could play safely. Brains is the first to arrive, only to find this last, once safe corner of their old and familiar world is in the process of being destroyed. The valuable plot is being redeveloped and a luxury modern home and neat garden will replace the derelict old buildings and neglected grounds. It's a place where the troop have enjoyed many happy hours. 
Once again, the juveniles don't grasp the implications. But to Brains and Bess, this is a catastrophic loss. Vervets have always adapted to change, but today is the pace of change simply too fast for the Parnies to keep up. While the Parnies have been away, the situation on Mount Edgecombe has escalated. The sugarcane gang have brought interprimate conflict and frustrations to a new level. It wouldn't really trouble me if they weren't around anymore, you know. I'm not a, a great fan of them, but I don't dislike them. They can be naughty at times, so you have to keep uh, watching. For example, as we're parting out here, they will be on a golf cart, digging out for golf balls and your wallet and cell phones and things like that. The Vervets have come to associate human possessions with food. We know what a cell phone is for, but to a monkey, this might contain something to eat and is therefore worth further investigation. If it's a colorful cell phone cover, then they're bound to pinch it and run off with it. Or if it's a bunch of keys with, with uh, colorful uh, tags, then they steal them and then they leave them up on the tree. Then you've got to give up playing golf and start climbing trees. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a nuisance. The sugarcane gang's raids on golf carts are a cause for irritation. But when the sugars target homes and backyards, residents become less philosophical. One cause of a special irritation with the residents is Gizmo and his associates' visits to the estate's many bird tables. John Rosewarn was a film set designer and is a man with a very well-equipped garage. He doesn't want to make a drama out of a crisis. Instead, he wants to find ways of deterring the persistent offenders without doing them any long-term harm. A short, sharp shock is what he has in mind with his specially modified bird feeder. Well, the monkeys, of course, love the feed, love the food. They just come along and tip it up and the seed pours out of there until you're losing all your seed all day. So I just put this little wire stand on little perch, as it were. So this is electrified. And if a monkey comes along, which they have done already, and they grab each side of this, they get a shock. 
Visiting birds aren't affected at all, but overreaching monkeys will think twice about coming back here again. I must tell you though that the monkeys are extremely clever because I only shocked one monkey and I saw it happen and I thought, oh well that's great, now I know that my bird feeder will stay full. I've never seen another monkey come anywhere near it. John Rosewarn knows that vervets are extremely clever and if he's going to stay ahead, he needs to come up with some new ideas. They are very frightened of snakes and I'm sure that if we could come up with something maybe built out of uh, bicycle inner tubes, racing bike tubes or something like that that could inflate and stand up um, to give the effect of a snake, I'm sure you'd be able to uh, keep the monkeys away from windows and uh, pet food and so on. While John ponders vervet deterrence, the Pawnees must take their battle to the sugarcane gang. Back in Mount Edgecombe, a meeting is now not a matter of if, but when. Brains charges, splitting the sugar's front line. The confrontation is fast and furious, but this time the tables are turned. It's the sugar's on the defensive, and the Pawnees fighting with a new determination. Bess, Halftail, and Lena lead the main female attack. With the Pawnees on the right, and with the slight advantage of the slope, they're able to push the sugar's back. Cool and Brains are there to make sure the females are secure. They need to establish their right to at least share in Mount Edgecombe's resources. It's a bittersweet victory. The withdrawal of the sugars comes at a price for Cool. The arch rivals have been beaten back, but he's collected an injury during the brawl. Cool receives recognition for his heroism. It may not be an outright victory, but the Pawnees are back on home ground. They have also renewed their right to access to Twin Palms, local resident Lynette Weber's vervet open house. But here too, things are changing. Lynette's activities have come under scrutiny. The Mount Edgecombe management are unhappy with her policy of feeding monkeys, and there's talk of closing down her operation. Generally, Vervets are seen as a, as a lower class citizen. Gone! And I don't think it's fair to discriminate against classing animals in a different light. So we need to get the estate management to, to work together with, with the environment to make it a happy place for both humans and animals. Well, quite a few things have changed over the last 10 years or so that I've been working with primates in Africa. Um, I don't think the actual numbers of vervet monkeys have increased a great deal. What's happened is that the number of people in vervet habitat has increased. Um, I don't think the problem's any worse. I think people have been living with monkeys for a very long time. But what's happened is that people have become less tolerant of monkeys. What is clear is that with two vervet troops, the sugarcane gang and the Pawnees now back on the Mount Edgecombe estate, tensions have moved up a gear. And this isn't a problem that can be ignored much longer. 
John Rosewarne has been busy. And if he's to stay ahead of the game, he needs to come up with some new ideas to keep humans and monkeys apart. The idea is to, to make it look venomous and to make it look seriously uh, poisonous. And of course, a lot of the snakes that are very poisonous are banded. What we're going to do here now is to put some leaves on this tray and see if we can't get it to lie in the leaves and then stand up. We've never tried it, so anything could happen. So. Considering the short amount of time we've been on this project, I think we've done well. It's a prototype and still some way off. Some ideas seem more likely to catch on than others. Collection day for the rubbish bins is a weekly flashpoint for humans and monkeys. John has another invention to reduce the conflict, and like all good ideas, the simpler they are, the better. Can he find a way of keeping a lid on the escalating situation? Let me clip that on there. The big trick that the monkeys developed, or what he does, is instead of sitting on the lid and trying to, to open it with his own weight on it, he's got past that already, is he knows to sit on the side and somehow flick it over. John, motivated by his love of all things African, tried to find solutions to reduce conflict between people and the original wild inhabitants struggling to survive in a changing world. John's monkey-proof bin addresses the symptoms, but not the cause of the conflict between people and primates. And for this to be totally successful, monkeys and humans need their own separate space. The Pawnee bush is free of all human intrusion. And this is also one of the very few conflict-free sources of natural foods in the area. What the pregnant Pawnee sisterhood most need now is security and the safety of their old roosting area in the Pawnee bush before the imminent arrival of their new babies. Palm fruits are going to be very important to the Pawnee sisterhood. Oily and sweet, rich in beta carotenes, high energy and very good for pregnant mums. And most importantly, this meal doesn't bring the Pawnees into conflict with people. Alpha male brain's confidence seems to be returning in the familiar surroundings of the Pawnee bush. He's not out of the woods yet and keeps a watchful eye on Robbie, who's bulking up on seasonal fruit. If Robbie is to continue his meteoric rise, he's going to need to maintain his fighting condition. And Bess is also busy feeding. And although not as advanced as Mafazi, she's also pregnant. Female vervets keep the males guessing. The father could be Robbie. Although their last date ended rather badly. But Brains hasn't been idle either. The alpha male and female have recently been seen mating. In the end, nobody will know for sure who's the daddy. But as long as the high-ranking males all think it might be them, the new generation of infants will stand a far better chance of survival. And it's the future of the troop that's now at stake as the Pawnees settle down for the night in the familiar surroundings of their ancestral home. <laughs>